A couple technical things that you might want to prepare is a good monitor and a color calibration software and tool. Ideally, when you're retouching, it should never be complete darkness, but it should be quite dim. Screen position is very important. Try having it away from direct sunlight, uh, away from windows, or even very bright lamps. And a Wacom tablet. I use it when I know that there's a lot of precise retouch work to be done. And actually, before I go into retouching, I also want to mention the philosophy of retouching. I think it's important that we cover this because as photographers, it's good to be on the same page when it comes to the morals. <laughs> there are different schools of thought when it comes to retouching. Some photographers prohibit it, some embrace it, some truly rely on it. I personally take the middle ground. I believe the original photo needs to be as technically sound as possible in regards to exposure, shutter speed, um, white balance, composition, etc. And then I edit the image as a whole to retouch little bits I missed or use techniques to entirely further tell the story. The stance obviously may apply to me differently than it might to you or other photographers because I'm treating my photography from a service uh, perspective. Whereas a pure photographer would probably try to find and or stick to your own photographic style or brand identity. For me, a lot of the photos I take are bespoke to the story that I want to tell on Cubicle with my editorial team. So sometimes this might call for a very 80s cinema inspired treatment. Uh, sometimes it might call for a hyper glossy modern look. So this is a classic reason why pre-production is as powerful as post-production, knowing what you want to expect at the very end. However, I personally know photographers who single-handedly ban the practice of retouch and color grading. And to some extent, I suppose film photographers are also in this category because you don't really retouch film. You accept uh, the the outcome as it comes, uh, unless they hand process their film in, in a dark room with dodge and burn techniques, but that's a different story. I also know some photographers that live by the fix it in post <laughs> attitude. Um, I include myself in this category a little bit uh, because it does allow you to be very flexible and it really helps overcome any shooting challenge because, for instance, if you have limited time with a subject or location, or if you're chasing sunlight, you might want to decide to rely on post-production so that ex you don't expend so much of your energy, not to mention your crew. Wherever you stand though, if the original photo is not of a certain standard, then whatever you do or don't in post, the image will fail. Guaranteed. Yeah. Again, think of cake. I love the cake analogy. <laughs> you guys all love cake. If your cake batter is mixed poorly, uh, like if you forget sugar or your butter is unmelted or something like that, then whatever fancy designer oven you have or some expert icing technique that you'll apply, your cake will taste like poop, right? <laughs> There's of course a lot of issues associated with retouching, especially in the fashion industry when it comes to beauty ideals or if you do photojournalism. My stance here is the so-called two-week rule. <laughs> um, if it's something that doesn't disappear in two weeks, uh, something like a zit or cold sore or, or a flyaway hair or something like that, it's best to leave it. This is obviously up to you, but it's just good to be on the same page when it comes to morality as photographers. The reason why I decided to do this workshop before sharing any details on how to shoot or what gear I work with, which by the way, tools do not determine the craftsman, is because knowing the limitations of post-production will vastly help with your pre-production and the shoot itself. Let's get started. Um, if you don't have Bridge, this is the point where you just drag your RAW file into Photoshop. It will toggle the same camera RAW dialog box as it would when you're working with Bridge. You have start items and not start items. We're going to select all of it. We want to give it a general edit to the entire batch, right? Command A to select all. Uh, Command R or Control R for camera RAW. Now, because these images were shot in a very similar studio lighting setup, I'm just going to find a sort of average image. I think this one is a good image. And then again, command A to select everything in, in your film strip. And then we're going to give it a very basic edit. The temperature evokes a very different mood. 
depending on how warm you go. So the warmer you get, it, it evokes different emotions. Colder it gets, it becomes more factual. If you don't know what something does, just take the arrow all the way to the left and all the way to the right to see wh what color information it deals with. Texture, we're gonna increase just a bit. Clarity, I'm gonna decrease because I want this to be a little bit more of a vintage feel. Vibrance and saturation deals with, if you bring it all the way down, you'll see that it doesn't become a fully black and white image. But whatever you do is affecting every single one of the photos. You want to get to a point where you're happy with the general color grading, and then you will go into the individual photos and then tweak them afterwards. I quite like where we're at already, but let me tweak some things with curves. Curves is one of my favorite tools. I like to use the targeted adjustment tool and basically just click on the lightest part of the image and you'll see where exactly on the curve it responds to. So if you can see, if I bring it closer to the brightness, which is up top left, or if I bring it a little bit lower, and then I'll find something like a midpoint and target that as well. Ooh, that's very dark, which is down here. Again, I'm just gonna target that. And going into the red channel, vintage photos tend to have a tinge of red in their shadow, so I'm just gonna bring that up a bit. And a bit of green in the highlights. So just a little bit of tweaking here. What I don't recommend doing in camera raw is giving um, textural details, things like noise or grain or, or sharpness, because this is something that we should be finalizing with at the very, very end of the retouch session, because you just don't know what kind of texture you'll be working on when you're getting rid of dust details or fixing someone's, someone's face. So leave the texture as original and glossy as possible. So here in effects, you'll see that there's a lot of grain control as well as uh, noise reduction control. These kind of changes should always be done at the very end of a retouch session once you're happy with the general cleanliness of the photo. In general, I'm very happy with this. I wanna come back to this image here. I wanted to show just how powerful a raw image can be. You'll notice that raw files are a lot heavier than normal JPEG or PNG files. This is because it retains all of the color and light information that was available on the time it was shot. And you'll see that bringing up exposure, it doesn't degrade the photo terribly. In a pinch, this will save your butt. This kind of image is a good candidate for a black and white image too. We'll see here. See, it gives it a quite a nice natural noise. So always shoot and roll, that's my lesson here. The more you play around, you'll understand what things do. A lot of photo editing is all about eyeballing. So just because a setting works on this photo doesn't mean that it works on another one. This is a prime reason why you shouldn't be relying too much on a, a preset that someone else built. It's all about contextual photo editing and making it your own. Once you're happy with the general color grading that you've given your images, you can make your own preset by going into the preset area here. As you can see, I have a crap ton of presets that I made over the, over the past few years. Clicking on create preset or command shift P, you can create your own. And I'm gonna call it Ryan Reynolds because I can. And you'll see that this is something that I made, let's say in 2018, the Sarah color. Immediately you can apply this preset into your image. Sometimes when I'm lacking inspiration, I just go into this list and try out something that I made a couple years ago. And sometimes that really just kicks off creative juices. And you'll see that all of your images, whether it's starred or not, will be updated with the color grading that you've given it generally. Okay. And now we're going to retouch our favorite images. Okay, so because this is a basics workshop, I'm not gonna go into too much technical details of how to retouch a photo. Uh, we're gonna focus on a, a couple very, very simple tools. These are some of the most essential tools even retouchers use on a daily basis. So you'll have, you'll have absolutely no problem taking your photo to the next level with just these tools. Before you do anything to the image, before you start cleaning up, changing things around, make sure to duplicate the background. 
Yeah. And then keep this as the original copy. It's very important in retouching that you are able to go back to the original without closing it down and reloading all over again. Yeah. You want to be able to retrace your steps as much as possible. Because at some point, when, when you're doing a lot of work on the image, the history panel will not be able to take you to a certain point. Yeah. So always keep an original as a backup and work on duplicates. So I'm going to call this cleanup. My favorite is the healing brush tool. If you hold it down, you'll see different, uh, different healing tools, such as the patch tool and the content aware move tool. Um, I like the healing brush tool because it gives you most flexibility and it comes in in a form of a brush. So when you right click, you'll, you'll be able to set the size of the brush. You'll see that. Yeah, the preview is, is just a circle and the hardness as well. The, the harder it is, the edges are harder. <laughs> so I'll just show you what a hard brush and a soft brush looks like. Mm, hardness 100 means that the edges are incredibly hard and having zero hardness means that the edges are fluffy. Yeah, so same applies to healing brush as well. So I can see a little bit of lens dirt here. Yeah, so holding down alt or option, you'll find the source of the texture that you want to replicate. And then you just scrub it over. I'm holding down the space bar to, and dragging the image around. Yeah, I see more dust here. Using the left bracket, I can, I can quickly reduce the size of the brush. Again, alt, hold down, pick a point of origin and then brush it over. Pick a point of origin, brush it over. Pick a point origin, brush it over. It's so easy. You get so quick at it. Uh, my advice is to pick a region that is quite close to the detail you want to remove because you don't want to be emulating this texture, for instance, here, because yeah, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. So just move it around, see if there's anything else. You can also zoom in by doing command plus going in very close and helping fix little blemishes on the flower. Yep. I'm using the healing brush tool as well. Yeah. Finding origin. Just gonna, I mean, don't, so this is a point where I have to say, don't worry too much about imperfections because imperfections is a part of photography. Okay. Now, there is a point where you might need to use the clone tool. The difference between a clone tool and a healing brush tool is that the clone literally clones whatever is the source. So for instance, if the source is here and I set the source here, it clones it. Yeah, it's literally the same thing. However, if I use the healing brush and I, cl and I set the origin here, it uses just the textural values. The point where you might need a clone brush is when you want to replicate exactly the same lines. Yeah, I'm happy with that. But in general, go back to healing brush. Yep. Yeah. So this image is already so much cleaner than the original. If you toggle it on and off, you'll see all the dirt particles all the dirt particles that used to exist. Okay. And I'm going to duplicate this again. Yeah. And call it dodge burn is the dodge and burn tool. It's right here. It looks like a little, yeah, a lollipop stick. Dodge makes things brighter. Burn makes it darker. <laughs> uh, it really helps you highlight certain elements and bring it forward, make it a little bit more alive, a bit more vibrant. You can change the range here from shadows, midtones, and highlights, um, and really just play around with it. Don't go too overboard with the, the dodge and burn tool, because before this, if you toggle it off, it was a bit stale, right? And then the burn tool, you just have to press it down. And that also gives a little more dimension to the photo, a little more depth a bit more richness when it comes to the contrasts. And this is all eyeballing again, right? Um, this is really up to you. It's your craft. So I like this already. I kind of want this vase to also pop out a little more. So I'm just going to 
dodge this just a little more as well. So if you toggle that off, see, there's a lot more light texture. There's a lot more life to this image. Okay, next step, Command J. I'm gonna do a, a liquify, which is one of my favorite tools for other reasons uh, that will be revealed shortly. But this is where you change your life. Go up to filter, liquify. And this is where we add <laughs> a bit of bust. Liquify tool by default will give you the forward warp, warp tool. Again, this works um, in a brush setting. So you can do bracket, left bracket makes it smaller, right bracket makes it bigger, etc. And here you go, magic. So we're really just kind of, we're really just kind of emphasizing the shape and giving it more dynamic. And, and I'm not going to show you how this should be applied on a model because that's up to your, you and your morality code. For instance, this can also be uh, used for more intricate things like maybe chain, maybe enhancing the richness of the petal. Yeah, giving it more curves. Again, not suggesting that you should be giving things curves, but it is a handy tool. <laughs> so this is yet another level where the photo becomes a lot more dynamic, right? Here you'll realize that when I toggle this off, you'll see that the vase shape has changed a little. This is a slightly more intermediate area when it comes to Photoshop, but I'm going to use a mask tool here. Yeah, the mask tool, when it's white, it means that everything's in light. So everything that we've liquefied is now visible in white, but I want certain things that we liquefied to not show. So I'm going to erase that out of the image. Yeah. But instead of erasing the actual layer, I'm going to make a mask and make sure you click on the, on the mask box instead of the image box. So the mask box and, uh, clicking on E for eraser. Um, again, this is also a brush form, uh, bring the size down, maybe up. I'm using brackets again. I'm just going to erase the bits that have been affected that shouldn't have been. So you'll see the black area here is the bit that you, you don't want the liquefied bits to be shown. Yeah. So it's, it's literally a masking tape. Yeah. So you'll see that only the flowers now are visible. I think I've done a slightly shoddy job here. I can see a bit of that. I'm going to paint it in using the brush tool or B. Again, that's a brush. So bring the size down to however much you need it. And I'm going to paint the mask back in so that we see only the liquefied bits. Yeah. Make sure your color is white. And I'm constantly clicking on command zero so that I see the larger photo. Okay. At this point, it might be useful to take a snapshot in the history panel. So if you don't see this, it's window history. Basically it saves a moment in time through your retouching journey. Yeah. When you click on the original, you can see original here, the snapshot remembers all the layers that you've built to get to this point. You might want to use snapshots in a more creative manner as well, because at some point you might want to change the flowers to pink and uh, call that snapshot two and then change it to a blue and call that snapshot three. And at the end, you can just decide which one you want to come back to so that you don't have to constantly be retouching the same photo over and over again. When it comes to color, there are so many ways of, of targeting different colors. You can use a, an adjustment layer such as hue and saturation, where you decide to target just the reds. So just targeting reds like this or target just the greens or get rid of that. Or you can go into image adjustments, selective color. And this is a lot more sophisticated when it comes to targeting. If you see the reds 
Jiggle these arrows around and see the minute changes that you can make to the colors to make it a lot more rich. Once you're in Photoshop cleaning up and retouching, you have to remember that you are not taking advantage of the camera raw file anymore. It's basically a flat image. Uh, so you can't go back to camera raw again. If you do want to go and give it a few more additional tweaking, you can always go up to filter and camera raw as well. This means that it will treat it as if it's a JPEG image though, so be careful. The crop tool is C on your keyboard. Don't be too invested in your original composition. Sometimes a composition needs to be tweaked. Uh, for a better result and better photo. You can also use the content aware functionality uh, when you want to kind of extend the canvas a little bit. Photoshop does a pretty good job. So for now, the preview is taking from the background color, right? But when you click on the yes, the checkbox, you'll see that it, it thinks for a little while, but it'll do a pretty good job. See what I mean? It's done an amazing job extending the background. So that's that. So these are some of the most essential tools that will take your photo to the next level. At this point, I will select all my layers, command J to duplicate by clicking merge layers or, and then this is the layer that has all of this information inside of it. Again, I don't want to overwrite any of these steps that I've made before, just in case I want to go back to it. In case the client says, actually, we want the flower to be blue and not have grain. The easiest way of adding sharpening is just going up to filter, sharpen, sharpen, which if you zoom in, you'll see the difference. A classic way of adding grain is going up to filter, noise, add noise, but I find that it's not as authentic when it comes to photography. It's, it's, the grain is a little too fine sometimes, and you kind of want that photographic grain instead of just a, a plain, fine sandy grain. I would recommend going up to filter, camera raw filter, adding the grain that is available in camera raw. So if you see here, if you zoom in, you'll see that you can also toggle how big you want the grain to be. So because it's a, a wide image, you need the grain to be a little bit of in the on the smaller side. You can change the roughness as well. And you're really helping the image to have authentic photographic grain. Yep, this looks good enough for me. And I'm gonna say, okay. See how difficult it would have been to clean up if we had baked in a grain in our camera raw process in the very beginning. So I'm gonna save this as a PSD because I wanna come back to this at some point, right? Just in case. And then again, save it as a JPEG or a TIFF image or a PNG, depending on what you want your output to be. Okay. Um, for example, this image, same technique. I'm just going to go through it without talking. Another snapshot before, after, before, after done. And I'll save this. Beauty of raw files and editing is that you can tell an entirely different story using just one photo. For instance, we shot this story back in August last year, and it was meant to be a very hyper glossy, very colorful story. The backdrop was white and the clothes were all colorful. It was all about color blocking. But just last week, we published an article on Cubicle. It was using the same images, but in a completely different treatment. This image looks like we shot the model against a beige slash gray backdrop and the lighting was very dim. Her makeup was quite muted with a dark lip, but she's wearing literally the same blazer as this here. She was wearing a red blazer. Her lips were painted very bright red. We just relied on the power of post-production to be able to create a, a whole new image. Yep. This photo here as well. So these two photos were shot a couple minutes apart on the same day, same setup, but this left story ran um, in a vampiric, all about cold weather and winter makeup, whereas this photo on the right ran in springtime. It was simply the difference of using a slightly warmer temperature on the right one. 
I'm going to edit these two photos as well to show you how easy it is to use the same tools to edit photos that feature portraits as well as the landscape. Um, I'm going to do it a little more cinematic style for these two. This is my favorite part using the clone tool. I'm just going to make them tree. And the smaller the brush, the more intricate you could be. Again, let me remind you of the two week rule. Okay. All right. Thank you for watching. I know this was long, but I tried to keep it as concise and informative as possible. So thank you for watching all the way till the end, as always, and not skipping. Also, back up, back up your files.